Welcome to the latest episode of In the World of Winooski. Today, we're dedicating time to reflect on the past year of COVID-19 in Vermont, um, the impacts on Winooski, and what we have learned that will take forward to build back stronger. I'm joined by City Manager Jesse Baker, Winooski School District Superintendent Sean Mannon, and the Executive Director, I'm sorry, Sean McMahon, and the Executive Director of the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, Amila Merzinovich. Last March, um, oh, thank you all for being here. Um, last March, I recall just experiencing a lot of uncertainty and confusion as we abruptly made shifts to city operations. Um, I saw and heard about the school operations changing and heard a, a little bit um, from your end, Amila, with USCRI. So I wonder if you could each just spend a moment um, sharing a bit about those early days and, and what did you have to do? Like how, what changes did you have to make to, to adapt? Um, can I start with you, Sean? Sure. Um, I, I think what, what has underlied this whole time and really started in earnest uh, for us that, that middle of March was the uncertainty. So we had the pandemic starting, we had uh, uh, anxiety rising around uh, very immediate and personal health needs. Um, and then we had uh, kind of state level concerns about uh, overloading the healthcare system, as we had seen starting to happen in some other states and, and even other countries uh, across our globe. And so uh, at the local level, that was very difficult to not have any clear clear guidance about uh, what we could do. And it, it basically was then uh, um, given to the locals to make decisions until that weekend before when the governor made the statement to dismiss schools. But the two weeks leading up to that were really, really difficult because um, people were just um, kind of living in a very uh, reactive, very emotional, anxious place. Um, so from a leadership perspective, we were managing human behavior more so than we normally do. Um, and at the same time, we were trying to make plans to move to a model of learning that uh, we were not so familiar with. We had a lot of the um, uh, uh, infrastructure already in place in terms of uh, uh, laptops and chargers and uh, all that good stuff. But the... the uh, uh, the ability to uh, learn and to teach online was not something that we had done a lot of, we dabbled with. So uh, that, that kind of typified our you know, early days of um, uh, those two weeks were something like I've never experienced and I know people in our organization have never experienced either. And in the end, I'm really proud of our community and, and the, the commitment, the, the um, the pace which which they moved, the care with which they moved, and keeping students at the center of all that throughout. Thanks, Sean. Um, Amila, I, your, your team does a lot of direct service provision with residents in Winooski. Tell us a little bit what that was like. Well, similarly, thank you first for um, inviting me to take part in this um, conversation similarly to what Sean said, the, uh, the, the two weeks leading up to the governor uh, implementing the uh, uh, emergency order and uh, ordering um, all um, organizations that are client facing uh, to go into lockdown were, were uh, very anxiety, uh, very intensive, very, um, very stressful. As you know, um, as you know, our model, our culture is, you know, to be welcoming to our uh, clients. We, um, you know, we don't have, we don't operate, although we should, uh, by appointment. We have an open door policy, and and you know, families come in as their need needs arise. Whether it's as you know, for something as simple as uh, looking at the piece of mail that they received, or you know, something more uh, substantial. So we very quickly we understood that our whole culture would, in the way we provide services and support our families, would would shift, uh, would have to shift pretty immediately. And so 
uh, once we uh, close the office, we, you know, our, our work uh, takes place in the community, in people's homes. Um, so very early on, we, um, you know, we had to take steps and put in the effort to, you know, reach out to as many families as possible and, um, you know, help people understand, you know, what, what were, as much as we understood at that point, what we were up against and, and the, you know, the immediate impact. Um, and then, um, you know, very, very early on, uh, many families were impacted by layoffs. So um, our, you know, services, and it became, um, you know, thinking back, I'm like, I, I'm actually feeling it physically. Um, it was all hands on deck, you know, it was, it, it did not matter who was a whose job is what at that point, you know, for myself, everyone, uh, we were, we were helping people with, you know, cl unemployment claims and, and, you know, applying for other support services, whether it's food stamps or accessing food, uh, communicating with landlords and, and employers and, um, and then the big, uh, you know, the big issue of how do we bring the information about, you know, this monster that COVID-19 was, coronavirus, in the culturally and linguistically appropriate manner to, to various community, uh, communities. So I will just mention that, um, you know, uh, uh, it was, you know, two people, two community members, Alison Seeger and Mohammed Jafar, uh, got together very early on and said, let's record a video in Somali and let's, let's you know, put it out uh, via social media. And from there, you know, they, but that was just one language. So, and then they pulled other partners in, including Sean and his team and the city and ALV. Um, and, you know, what, what was started by two people is, is today known as the Vermont Coronavirus Multilingual Task Force. We have a YouTube channel. We have put out 400 plus videos in 14 different languages in, you know, from everything, A to Z, COVID-19 and, and vaccine. And, and um, so our yeah, our our work, our culture uh, shifted, and um, we are still officially closed. Uh, the office is closed. We have five staff going in at staggered schedules, but our work has very much continued, um, all in accordance with you know safety measures. But you know our uh, our work cannot stop. Could couldn't stop. Um, yeah, I, um, you mentioned the multilingual task force, and I know that that's been a critical um, group in getting information out to folks who need it, you and your organization. I have heard about the countless hours that you all spend, even on the weekends, um, trying to make sure that things are getting where they need to go. Um, and I know, you know, Sean, um, yourself, members of your staff, there's just this going above and beyond we've seen the need to do like food delivery, or I know um, faculty was going to check in at students' homes when they hadn't heard from them. So definitely have seen shifts in, you know, what your standard operations may have been before. Um, Jesse, can you talk briefly about uh, what, what the city had to do to pivot? Sure, um, thank you for having me and thank you, Sean and Amila for being here as well. Um, so the three things that I really think about when I think back to March um, and our pivot on the municipal side was one teamwork. I remember a night very early on, but right before the state of emergency was declared, huddling over a conference table with Sean and his leadership team and me and my leadership team trying to figure out what was happening. We wouldn't do that today, but it really felt from the beginning like a Things are changing really fast. We have this very heightened level of anxiety on our teams. We're all in it together. How can we support each other through it? And I think this that's always been a strength of this community. And I think that really came out um, in those early days. The second thing from a municipal perspective was regional support. Early in March, when we kind of saw something was coming, um, the managers across Chittenden County met and, and 
started to craft um, plans for if our a department went down, if we didn't have a wastewater treatment plant operator in place, how we would share services and, and basically do that off the books, just figure out who needed what and be there to support them to do it. And then third in March for our pivot was really focusing on our um, first responders, our emergency, our essential workers, you know, those folks that couldn't go home that needed to be staffing the fire trucks, the police trucks, the ambulances, the, you know, the wastewater treatment plants required daily testing, you know, somebody had to come in and do that. Um, so how did we ensure that those folks who were going to continue to be out in the world could do that as safely as possible to ensure the public safety here in Winooski? It is crazy to think that it has been more than a year now um, and we still haven't returned to our previous operations. Um, I wanna go back to, I like what you shared Jesse about um, huddling with the school leadership team at the conference table. And I know that that grew into a weekly, um, a weekly check-in with our, our partner organizations like USCRI, um, AALV, the Housing Authority, et cetera. And, you know, Jesse, you have done a great job of facilitating those meetings. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that came together um, and, and how through that group and the other huddles that um, you pulled together, we were able to support during our outbreak in June um, as testing came out um, and how we've been able to, to leverage leverage our partners here in Winooski to, to get services out. Sure, thank you. Um, so the Winooski, I think one of the things we should acknowledge about how privileged we are in Vermont is to have leaders at all level, especially at the state level who are really data-driven, science-driven and best practice driven. So in the early days, one of the things that we were encouraged to do was look at the CDC best practices around pandemic response and understand at the community level how we support. And one of their best practices was convening um, regular check-in times to share resources, check-in times with executives to share resources. Um, so I, I think, I didn't actually go back and look at this, but I think in the last week of March, we had our first Winooski leadership briefing, which brought executives from the city, school, nonprofit partners like Amila, um, ALV, um, our big housing partners, um, our medical providing partners, our faith communities, our business communities, bringing all those, those executives virtually together to share information, share quick updates, things were changing really fast. And again, really thinking at some point we might need to share ability. So if one organization's finance department was not able to function, could another organization's finance team step in? That was really kind of the initial goal to share information, ensure that people had the resources they needed and be able to pivot quickly. So we held those weekly for six months, um, just as a check-in time for um, leaders to come together and share information. Um, that model really worked and became something that I think is now ingrained in our culture. We were also able to amend it um, and add in a few more partners when we had the first community spread outbreak in June. Um, so at that point, we started daily what we called huddles with first thing in the morning with the Vermont Department of Health and our community partners and the school. Um, and again, really use that time to share information, make sure our families were getting the services they needed through people who had the culturally appropriate, linguistically appropriate abilities to do that, made sure they were compensated for doing that work, um, and really were able to very quickly wrap our, our hands around families who were experiencing trauma and sickness and, and stem that tide, bend that curve, make sure our community stayed um, healthy in the future. So really thankful for all those leaders in our community who came together and spent time in those meetings and huddles with us. Yeah, and um, you know, Sean and Amila, both of you have been there this whole time and I think have done a lot of the advocacy to kind of shift how information or how services were getting out there. So we'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I'll, I'll start Amila if that's all right because I, I was taking some notes while Jesse was talking and I'm like flowing back to all of these memories in the year, you know, that some of them I thought I'd forgotten. But um, I think that the, the beginning with the Winooski Leadership Briefing Group, um, that was uh, 
foundational and genius to do that. Um, thank you, Jesse. And uh, it was kind of, to me, it was a couple of steps. It was bringing people together, decision makers, um, to communicate and then to prioritize. And it was also a place for leaders to get support from each other. And so that led us to, um, well, I'll use an example to walk through this. The example would be food security. So what we maybe, maybe didn't realize originally in our silos was there was a lot of food resources out there. And so for us to get together, to coordinate between all of the, the Vermont Food Bank, the school district, uh, ALV, USCRI, the Winooski Food Shelf, we realized like, okay, we're, we're doing okay. Like food security is in pretty good shape. Then we can move on to another challenge to try and meet another need in the community. But the, the briefing teams then led to having this collaborative trusted group in place so when we hit June and there was an outbreak, it wasn't relearning. It was, okay, let's get down to business. Let's figure out how we support our community and solve these challenges and support everyone. And then that led to December when the school district was in the middle of it uh, and we had to go to remote learning. Um, you know, We felt very supported by everybody in doing that. That then led to uh, vaccination clinics. And this group advocating and bringing in the Department of Health and getting decision makers, policy makers at the table to meet the specific needs of our community really around limited English proficiency folks and BIPOC folks. And I think that has been one of the greatest uh, uh, achievements throughout this um, by the leaders across our community and all of our partners is those kind of steps that got us to prioritizing our most vulnerable people who were disproportionately affected uh, by COVID-19. That was so well said. Sean, the couple things I would like to, I guess, emphasize is um, the, well, first, you know, kudos to you, Jesse, and, and you know, gratitude for your leadership and for bringing us all together and, and uh, moving, us, moving us forward and, and your advocacy on behalf of, you know, all, all Winooski residents and, and really all Vermonters, uh, whether it was around access to testing or, or now the vaccine, um, it's, uh, it, it, you've been an inspiration uh, to say the least. Um, also, what you said, Jesse, about, you know, uh, all of us as Vermonters being so, so privileged and, and for myself, who, you know, came to this country as a refugee, being so lucky to end up in Vermont and to have the, you know, state leaders who are still listening and hearing what we who are on the ground, community-based organizations, um, are identifying as needs, as barriers to access services, uh, and and really implementing um, our uh, our recommendations. So grateful for that. Um, the other uh, really um, unique sort of, but I'm now hearing it's it's happening in other states. But I'm gonna say we did it first. Uh, even if we didn't, is implementing, uh, it started with testing back in June, implementing testing sites where going where people are and doing it in the way that is, it feels welcoming and it feels safe. So, so doing it in the parking lot in front of the O'Brien Center, which is where, you know, people, people are familiar with that space and feel safe. And then with the vaccine, once the vaccine rolled out, you know, having it at, in, in the locations in uh, both Burlington and Winooski that feel safe and welcoming. That has made a huge difference. Um, as we know, in, in some of the refugee communities, there is a lot of, there are a lot of myths, um, not only refugee, you know, this sort of permeates borders. Um, it, it's not unique to any any you know, community group, but there's a lot of myths, a lot of uh, uh, sort of stigma around um, the virus itself and now the vaccine. 
Um, so, uh, you know, having uh, having those um, clinics in the place that feels safe, uh, and with um, you know having it staffed by you know uh, people who are community members, um, trusted community members, and and interpreters uh, ha has made a huge difference. Amila, what you were you were just describing about um, trying to lower these barriers or, or doing this advocacy um, through testing through the vaccine clinics, um, even when it came to the messaging and um, supporting folks in quarantine, et cetera. I think about like coming out of this pandemic and moving forward. And I think these the leadership briefing, the huddles, the work that's been happening collaboratively is just a really good exemplar of why culturally we are starting to focus on diversity and inclusion and wanting to have more voices involved. Um, having these meetings with so many different stakeholders there, um, folks who are actually in touch directly with different members of our community and different families. I, I've heard so many issues raised that I wouldn't know about otherwise because they're not the things I'm experiencing and just being daily reminded that you know, everyone's experience is different and, and valid and we need to address all of those um, or do the best we can to try to support everybody. Um, I think that I've, I'm feeling a little bit heart won by that, but um, <laughs> I wonder um, if you all wanna share something else that you, you're thinking about how you're gonna move forward, um, you know, on a very basic level, I've enjoyed having, um, residents being able to like call into a city council meeting instead of showing up. Um, but I'm sure there are so many other things. So um, whoever would like to start first. I guess I'll just add um, what I'm hoping to hold on to um, is those relationships. I think we, we strengthened, we had solid relationships to begin with, which allowed us to be a strong community from the beginning. But the depth of them now and the true trust in each other and trust in messages and what we need to do to, to make our systems um, more anti-racist, to make our systems more equitable is at the foundation now. And the relationships and the trust we have in place across our community now to continue to do that work. Um, I feel like we made a huge leap forward in that in the last year. And I um, really look forward to seeing that continue post pandemic and, and so many other things we could do together. I'm really looking forward to seeing all of you in person. <laughs> um, and I echo what you said, Jesse, the, those relationships, um, uh, you know, will will continue beyond, uh, you know, this situation we I you know, Vermont has been a welcoming state, Winooski has been a welcoming city for refugees for over four decades. And, you know, this last year has, has you know, strengthened those relationships even more um, and has made us all more nimble and, um, you know, able to respond quickly to, you know, uh, you know, any, almost anything that you know that came our way uh, we found we found a way to address it and uh, uh, and and to make sure that our community members are being supported I will not miss daily 8:30 huddles <laughs> uh, well yes completely 100% echo affirm the relationships that have been built and to continue those deepen them and you know for the benefit of our communities um, the second thing I, th I think that we need to we keep we need to kind of keep the the heat on a little bit is what we've learned about it has revealed a need for a universal approach across our systems health education employment etc to provide equitable access um, through interpretation, through translation, through the needs for uh, transportation, bringing things to people. Um, and th that requires investment. 
And so, uh, you know, much of what we did this year was out of pure human commitment, um, tireless energy um, uh, to, to our community. And if we don't build the system moving forward, we will end up in this position again. And so um, I think all of us as leaders need to continue to advocate for that, for the investment at the state level, at the local level, so that um, we create those universal systems that are gonna provide better access, more timely communication and so forth um, to the people in our communities that deserve that. That's really well said, Sean. Um, and I think it, it's making me think about how in the past, maybe we've been less universal and less collaborative. We get sort of held up by the structures that we already have. Um, and only in this like very visible, tangible crisis, um, we move beyond that in some, in some aspects. And it, it would be easy to let that go as the sort of the urgency falls away. Um, and it is something that we'll have to keep our eyes on. I think that's also a great thing to keep in mind as federal funding is flowing to our state over um, the course of this year, that we should be thinking about, like, how can we make these systemic change? How can we use this money to make these systemic changes um, and, you know, continue to improve the way we're supporting our residents going forward? I also just want to recognize the importance of both formal and informal community leaders. I think that's another aspect of this collaborative approach and having many voices is, is knowing that there are, are already folks out there who I can't reach everyone in the city and my methods of communication can't reach everyone. So being able to lean on folks that already have those relationships is incredibly valuable. And to Jesse's point earlier, like compensating people for that work, recognizing it. Um, there's just a lot that we can take out of this. So I just really want to express like deep gratitude to all of you for all of the work that you've been putting in um, and I know we'll continue to do. And I, I think, and, and this is just as, there's only four of us here, right? There's been so many people involved in, in carrying Wolniski through this um, and know that we will continue to do that. and. I, I look forward to maybe in July-ish um, seeing folks out and about in town. So thank you so much.